monastic wisdom. The Letters of St. Joseph the Hesychist. Dedication by the Holy Fathers of the Holy Monastery of St. Anthony the Great, Florence, Arizona. We humbly dedicate this volume to all the divinely illumined ascetics of the Holy Mountain who have left us as an inheritance their monastic wisdom. The waves of thoughts amaze my mind. My tongue grows numb and cannot speak, unable to utter the words in time. The noetic siphons gush forth dew in torrents. However, there is but little soil in our days. The riches of our Lord are many, but unfortunately there are few heirs. To inherit them requires a bloody struggle, but here there is only laziness. Thus I am compelled to open the ducks unto the world, for there is hope that pure souls will receive the word, and then I shall receive the reward of love. So listen to my words. Lend me your ears. Preface by our holy elder Ephraim among the saints. I was 19 years old, I remember, when I followed the path that took me to the garden of the Theotokos, the holy mountain. The road that led me to the monastic life was shown to me by my philomonastic mother, now nun Theophano of blessed memory. During the first years of hardship during the German occupation, when for the sake of work I had to stop going to high school, a hero monk from the Holy Mountain came to be the parish priest in one of the two old calendar churches in Volos, Greece. He was a disciple of an elder known as Elder Joseph the Hesychist, and he became my spiritual father. This hero monk from the Holy Mountain was for me at that time a precious advisor and helper in my spiritual journey. With the many stories he told me about the Holy Mountain and with his spiritual counseling, I soon began to feel my heart drifting away from the world and cleaving to the Holy Mountain. Especially when he would speak about the life of Elder Joseph, I would burn with ardent desire for the day that I would meet him. When the time finally came, September 26, 1947, a small boat brought us slowly one morning from the world to the Holy Mountain as if the shores of the ephemeral to the other side of the eternity. At the dock of St. Anne's, a venerable old man, Yerinda Arsenios, was waiting for me. Aren't you Johnny from Volos? he asked. Yes, I replied. But how do you know me? Oh, he said, the honorable forerunner appeared to Elder Joseph last night and said to him, I am bringing you a little lamb. Put it in your sheepfold. My thoughts were fixed on the honorable forerunner my patron saint on whose birthday I was born. I was very grateful to him for looking out for me in this way. So, Johnny, let's go, said Arsenios, for Yerunda's waiting. We started up the narrow cobblestone path. What feelings! Try as one might, they cannot be described. That night within the small chapel of the honorable forerunner that was built in a cave, I did my matanya of obedience to my elder. It was within that dimly lit chapel that my soul became acquainted in its own way with the luminous countenance of my holy elder. Spiritually and physically, I was the youngest in the Synodia, and Elder Joseph was one of the greatest hagiuritic spiritual personages of our times. I stayed by his side, learning from him for twelve years. That was how long he lived thereafter. The Lord made me worthy of serving him until his last holy breath. And he was worthy of being served because of his many spiritual toils and holy prayers that he left to us as a precious spiritual inheritance. When I met him, he was a true God-bearer, a spiritual general par excellence, most experienced in the battle against the passions and the demons. It was impossible for a person to come and stay with him and not be cured of his passions, regardless of how many and how strong they were, as long as he was obedient to him. The elder always taught his monks that Christ-like obedience was more important than anything else. He permitted the Christians in the world who knew him to practice noetic prayer, but always under the guidance of those who were experienced, for he had seen much delusion and had become fearful of it. He would often tell us, if you see a person not asking for advice or not heeding advice given to him, expect to see him deluded soon. 
As for our ascetic struggles, he was most strict. With all his soul, he loved fasting, vigils, and prayer. His food was always in moderation. He did not eat f freshly cooked food if he knew that there were some leftovers from the day before or even three days before. Concerning the diet of us younger members of the Brotherhood, however, he was more moderate. Seeing our many physical weaknesses, he deemed this necessary, but it was as if this concession used up all his lenience. Beyond that, he was extremely demanding. Not that he didn't know how to forgive mistakes or put up with weaknesses, but he wanted us to employ all our spiritual and physical powers in our ascetic endeavors. He would say, quote, Whatever we do not give to God to use in our ascetic struggle will be used by the other one, i.e. Satan. Our Lord gives us the commandment to love him with all our soul and all our heart so that the evil one cannot find a place to rest within us. End quote. We would stay awake all night in prayer. This was our typicon. He demanded that we struggle, shed our blood against sleep and carnal thoughts. He kept vigil in the darkness of his tiny cell with his inseparable companion, unceasing noetic prayer. Even though he was secluded in his cell, he knew that what was going on outside and how we were doing. With a simple glance, he could read our thoughts. Whenever he saw that we were in need of spiritual toning, he would relate to us the various wondrous and ascetic feats of the fathers of the holy mountain. He was very captivating in his narrations. When he would start talking, you would not want him to stop. Despite his natural gift of narrating, many times it would seem that he was having difficulty when he would try to speak to us about divine illumination and the various states of grace, because human vocabulary was poor and in insufficient for him to express those deep meanings. He would become silent and distant, unable to communicate to us those things which exist in the utterly unknowable super brilliant apex of mystics where the simple and absolute the immutable and ineffable mysteries of theology lie my elder did not study academic theology but he theologized with profound depth he writes in one of his letters quote, when through obedience and hezekiah a monk's senses have been purified his noose has been calmed and his heart has been cleansed he then receives grace and enlightenment of knowledge. He becomes all light, all noose, all lucid. He overflows with so much theology that even if three people were to start writing down what they were hearing, they could not keep up with the current of grace coming out in waves, spreading peace and utmost quiescence of passions throughout the body. The heart burns with divine love and he cries out, Hold back, my dear Jesus, the waves of thy grace, for I am melting like wax. Truly he melts, unable to bear it. His noose is caught up into theoria. A mixing occurs. He is transformed and becomes one with God to the point that he cannot recognize or distinguish himself. Just like iron in a furnace becomes one with the fire. End of quote. From the 48th letter. From these words we see that the divine cloud, which is illumined by the uncreated light, was not something unknown or inaccessible to him, but he knew it as a place and a manner of God's presence, as an ineffable mystery, as resplendent light. And all this was because the elder knew how to pray. Many times we saw him after hours of prayer of the heart, with his face changed and bright. It is not at all strange that the light in which his soul continuously bathed would at times also visibly bathe his body. Besides, the halos on saints and angels we see depicted in, on icons are simply a reflection of the uncreated light of grace which shines within them. The elder's purity was truly astonishing. I remember that when I would enter his cell at night, it was all fragrant. I felt the fragrance of his prayers imbue everything that surrounded him, affecting not only our internal senses, but our external senses as well. Whenever he talked to us about the purity of soul and body, he always used the All-Holy Mother of God as an example. Quote, I cannot describe to you how much Panagia loves chastity and purity. 
for she is the only pure virgin, and that is how she wants us and loves us all to be. There is no sacrifice more fragrant to God than purity of body and soul, which is obtained through the shedding of blood in a dreadful struggle. End quote. He would then conclude, So struggle forcefully in purifying the soul and body. Do not allow any carnal thoughts to enter the noose at all. As for silence, he would not utter a single word unless it was necessary. Especially during Great Lent, when he was alone with Elder Arsenios, they were silent the whole week. They spoke only when necessary, from Vespers on Saturday until Sunday evening Compline, and then remained silent again throughout the following week, using hand signals to communicate when necessary. Because he had found this practice very salutary, he forbade us to talk as well, except when absolutely necessary. When he would send us away from the hermitage on a task, we were not allowed to talk to anyone. I remember that when I returned, he always interrogated me thoroughly to see if I had been obedient and had kept absolute silence. For a minor transgression of two or three words, my first penance was 200 matanyas. But this heavenly man was truly a master at curing his disciples from their passions. If they managed to stay beside him in obedience, they experienced spiritual rebirth. Many came to him to learn by his side, but only a few stayed. It was not easy to live with him. Some would find it hard to believe how he would rebuke my unworthiness as an expression of his paternal love and care for my soul. For example, in those twelve years that I lived with him, rarely did I hear him call me by name. To call me or address me, he used all kinds of insults with appropriate adjectives. But the driving force behind all that masterful verbal abuse and insult was true paternal affection and a sincere interest in the cleansing of my soul. How grateful my soul is now for that paternal affection. We stayed in the wilderness for a number of years, but because of the, my many hardships, almost all of us grew ill. The elder was informed in his prayers that we would move down from the crags where we were in small St. Anne's Skeet. So we moved down to New Skeet. There the climate was milder. We toiled less, and we all regained our health, all except the elder. He was ill throughout his entire life. Due to his fasting, the toils of his lengthy vigils, the sweat of his prayers, and even from the tempter, his body became one great sore. One day I asked him, Yeronda, why, after so much exhaustion, do you still fast? I fast now, my child, so that our good God may give his grace to all of you. In spite of his physical ailments and pains, he would feel so much bliss and serenity within his soul that he found it hard to describe. He would only say that he felt something like paradise within him. Finally, the time came for his departure. He had awaited death all his life for his sojourn here was nothing but trials and afflictions. His soul longed for rest and so did his body. And even though he had firmly implanted within us the remembrance of death, his familiarization with that most dreadful mystery, death, made a very strong impression on us. It seemed as though he was getting ready for a festal celebration. That was how much his conscience informed him of the divine mercy that awaited him. But even so, during his last few days, he wept more than usual. To console him, Elder Arsenio said, Yeronda, you have toiled and prayed so much all your life. You have cried for your soul so much, and you are still weeping? Eh, Yeronda Arsenio, that is true, but I am only human. How can I know whether or not my deeds are pleasing to God? He is God and does not judge as we humans do. Besides, it is not as if I am coming back to weep again. This is my last opportunity. The more one mourns and weeps for his sins, the more he will be consoled. His love toward the mother of God was beyond any description. As soon as he mentioned her name, his eyes would shed tears. He had been beseeching her for some time to take him from this life so that he could rest and the queen of all hearkened to his supplication. She informed him 
one month before his departure, that his time had come. The elder then called me and told me what to prepare. We waited. On the eve of the dormition of the Theotokos, the 14th of August, 1959, Mr. Sotiris Skornas from Volos passed by to see them. They were very good friends. How are you, Yerunda? How is your health? Tomorrow, Sotiri, I'm leaving for the eternal fatherland. Remember my words, tomorrow when you hear the bells toll. That night, during the vigil of the dormition of the Theotokos, the elder chanted along with the rest of the fathers as much as his ailing body permitted. During the divine liturgy, right before he was to partake of the Immaculate Mysteries, he said, quote, provision for life eternal. It was early in the morning, the 15th of August. The elder was sitting in his meritic little chair in the yard of our Hezekasterion. He was awaiting the hour and moment of his departure. He was sure of the Panagia's promise. As time passed and the sun began to rise, though, it seemed that he was starting to worry about the delay. It was the last visit of the evil one. He called me and asked, My child, why is God slow in taking me? The sun is rising and I am still here. Yeranda, don't worry. We shall say the prayer for you now, and then you will leave. His tears stopped. All the fathers were saying the prayer intensely with their prayer robes. Not more than fifteen minutes had passed before the elder said, Call the fathers of the Synodia to come and do their last matanya because I am leaving. We all did our last matanya and received his blessing. Shortly thereafter, he started to stare up in the sky for about two minutes. Then, turning to us, full of serenity and indescribable spiritual amazement, he said to us, Everything is finished. I am leaving. I am departing. Bless. He then bent his head down to the right, opened and closed his eyes and mouth calmly for two or three times, and that was it. He gave up his soul to him whom he longed and worked for since his youth. His death was truly holy. To us, it brought a feeling of resurrection. In front of us, we had a dead person, and mourning was appropriate. Yet within us, we were living the resurrection. This feeling has never left me. It is this feeling that always accompanies my memory of my ever-memorable holy elder. Elder Joseph was unlettered as far as his secular schooling was concerned. He had only completed his second year in elementary school. But he was wise in things divine, for he was tutored by God. The University of the Wilderness taught him what we basically need, the divine. We know that monastics will benefit from the elders' letters. We also know that many lay people who are fighting the good fight in the world will also be benefited. God only knows who else will benefit from the elders' letters. However, these things are not readily assimilated without a brave spirit, nor can they be applied in our lives without a spiritual struggle and much toil. We thank everyone and call upon the elders' prayers for those who contributed to this publication. We humbly ask forgiveness for all our mistakes. Signed, Archimandrite Ephraim former abbot of the Holy Monastery of Philotheu on the Holy Mountain. Prolegomena by Dr. Constantine Carvarnos Since the appearance of my book, Anchored in God, in 1959, where I devote a chapter to my 1958 meeting with Blessed Elder Joseph the Hezekist and his disciple, Hiramunk Ephrem, both of Nuski, Manathos, Readers of that book have been asking me from time to time for more information about Father Joseph. Some want to learn more about my meeting with him, others to know if any of his writings have been published in English translations. Such questions increased since the publication of my second book on Athos, entitled The Holy Mountain, in 1973. In it, I devote several pa pages to Father Joseph, presenting his biography deriving my data from a 75-page Greek manuscript entitled The Life of Our Ever-Memorable Father Joseph the Hezekist. This work was written in 1962 by his disciple 
Joseph the Younger, then a monk at Nuskeet, and now a spiritual father at the great Athenite monastery of Vatopedi. The present book constitutes the best response to the questions raised by the readers of my above-mentioned books, and I am sure it will be received with great joy by all persons who are sincerely interested in authentic Orthodox spirituality. It is comprised of 82 letters, most of them addressed to monks and nuns who sought the elders' spiritual guidance. Taken together, they constitute a great treasury of teachings on the spiritual life. They provide valuable instruction on many phases of it. This instruction is based on the Holy Scriptures, the writings of the Holy Fathers of the Orthodox Church, the lives of saints, and on the elders' own life as a spiritual striver and guide at the Holy Mountain. In order to properly understand his teaching, it is best to begin by taking note of the written sources of his teaching and some of his exemplars among the saints of the past. As far as writings are concerned, Father Joseph mentions here and there the following. 1. Holy Scripture. 2. The ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. 3. The spiritual homilies of St. Macarius the Egyptian. 4. The Contrite Discourses of Abba Dorotheus. 5. The Evergetinos. 6. The Philokalia. 7. The Sayings of the Desert Fathers. 8. Books of Lives of Saints. 9. The Way of a Pilgrim. And 10. The Salutations of the Theotokos. About the Holy Scriptures, he says, quote, Always have the New Testament in your pocket. And when you find a brief opportunity, read an excerpt. Thus Christ gives you light and guides you towards his commandments. He completes your love and guides you to imitate him. End quote from letter 78. About the Old Testament, he says, quote, Piously read the Old Testament and you will extract the divine nectar of faith and love. In it God spoke directly to men and angels guided them. End quote. In the letters, there are innumerable quotations from the Holy Bible. About the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian and the spiritual homilies of St. Macarius the Egyptian, Father Yosef remarks, quote, Purchase these books and you will greatly benefit. End quote. Letter 2. Recommending Abba Dorotheus' book, he says that it is, quote, a very contrition-evoking, well-written, and of great spiritual benefit. End of quote from letter 16. Speaking of the Evergetinos, he says, There you will find many stories that will benefit you greatly. This monumental Byzantine work of the 11th century presents teachings and instructive incidences of hundreds of early desert fathers and some desert mothers. I discuss it in volume 1 of my new library. From the sayings of the desert fathers, the elder quotes this striking statement. Quote, an angry and irritable man is not accepted in the kingdom of God, even if he raises the dead. End of quote from letter 6. He recommends again and again reading the lives of saints. In one of his letters he remarks, quote, The lives of saints and the writings they left us warm up the fervor of your soul and incite in it to desire ardently our sweetest Jesus, just as officers in the army tell their troops, about the feats of the brave and thus make them fight valiantly. Letter 11. In another letter he says, quote, Read the lives of saints and see how many hardships they endured against their old man, spoken of by St. Paul in Romans 6.6. 6. Letter 23. And in still another letter he says, quote, If you read the lives of saints and toil, pray a little at night, you will quickly obtain what you seek and your soul will rejoice that Christ loves you so much. End of quote, letter 77. About the book, The Way of a Pilgrim, the Blessed Elder advises one of his spiritual children to acquire copies of it and distribute them to Christians, that they might benefit spiritually. From letter 78. It is worth noting that in my meeting with him, which I describe in Anchored in God, Father Joseph said to me, quote, I suggest strongly that you read The Way of a Pilgrim. This book shows the importance of mental prayer, or prayer of the heart, and the manner in which it is to be practiced. The first part of this work is more valuable than the sequel, which seems to have been added by another author. 
With regard to the salutations of the Theotokos, he advises, quote, read them and she will always guard you from every evil, end of quote, letter 78. All reading of edifying writings, he emphasizes, quote, should be done with much attention so that with all this the soul may increase and grow. Thus the old man fades away and dies, whereas the new man is renewed and overflows with the love of Christ. And then a person is no longer pleased at all with earthly things, but continuously hungers for the heavenly, end of quote, letter five. Also important for properly understanding the elder, besides the writings he recommended for reading, is taking note of some of the saints he particularly admired. He mentions St. Isaac the Syrian, Andrew the Fool for Christ, Anthony the Great, Arsenios the Great, Lucas of Styrion, Macarius the Egyptian, Mary the Egyptian, Nectarius of Egina, Onufrios, and Peter the Athenite. He calls Abba Isaac the Syrian, quote, the boast of hesychism and the consolation of ascetics, who assures and encourages spiritual strivers more than all the other fathers do. Letter 82. He calls Nectarios a great saint and notes that he read Nectarios' letters and learned from him the need of paying attention to doctors and medicines. Quote, During my earlier period, remarks Father Joseph, I wanted to heal only through faith, but now I too am learning that both medicines and grace are necessary. From St. Nectarios, he also learned the importance of watching one's diet. Thus he tells one of his spiritual children, Take control of your appetite. Don't eat things that you know are harmful to your health. Fried foods, salty foods, sauces, pork, meats, salted fish, alcoholic beverages in general. End quote from letter 49. About Saints Anthony the Great, Onufrius, Mary the Egyptian, and Luke of Styrion, he remarks that they were highly gifted mentally and were taught by God, receiving teachings from God without a teacher, from letter 3. However, he emphasizes that generally a spiritual striver needs a wise and experienced guide in order to tread safely and successfully the path that leads to purity and spiritual perfection. The beginning of the path is self-examination with a view to self-knowledge. Know thyself is a phrase that appears in several of his letters. The first and foremost step that one must take, says Father Joseph, is to know oneself. That is, to know who you really are in truth and not what you imagine you are. With this knowledge, you become the wisest man. With this awareness, you reach humility and receive grace from the Lord. However, if you don't obtain self-knowledge, but consider only your toil, know that you will always remain far from the path. From letter three. Knowing yourself consists in knowing your weaknesses, passions, and shortcomings. The elder placed great emphasis on the need of becoming aware of your passions and proceeding to struggle to overcome them, to free yourself from them, to attain passionlessness, which means purity. This high spiritual state can only be attained, he stresses, by persistent struggle and divine grace. Passion, pathos, in orthodox patristic writings is a term used in two senses. A, to denote bad thoughts charged with emotion. And B, vices. That is, such thoughts become habits, settled dispositions of the soul, bad traits of character. All the passions are viewed by Father Joseph as diseases of the soul in need of therapy. Removing them from the soul is a process he calls, as do the Holy Fathers of the past, purification. This restores the soul to a state of health and peace. Quote, the more you are purified from the passions, the more peace you have, the wiser you are, the more you understand God. End of quote from letter 65. Success in this is attained when the striver is helped by divine grace, called by the elder purifying grace. This, quote, mystically helps the struggling penitent to be purified from sins and to be in a state according to nature. For the passions entered the nature of man after Adam's disobedience, whereas the natural state in which man was created by God was passionless. End of quote from letter 82. Blessed Father Joseph distinguishes 
three stages of the spiritual life. One, the stage of purification, which has already been discussed. Two, the state, stage of illumination. And three, the stage of perfection. The second and the third stages lift man to a state above nature. During the stage of illumination, the mind is illuminated by illuminating grace and perceives everything clearly. Quote, One receives the light of knowledge and is raised to the vision of God. This does not mean seeing illusory lights, fantasies, and images. It means radiance of the mind, clearness of thoughts, and depth of ideas. The mind receives divine illumination and becomes entirely divine light by which one mentally perceives the truth and discerns how he must proceed until he reaches love, which is our sweetest Jesus. End quote. Letters 2 and 82. Quote, the third stage of the spiritual life is that of the grace of perfection. He writes in letter 2. This grace perfects the spiritual striver. It wipes out all the passions and preserves all the virtues as part of one's nature without one needing to use his own devices and methods to do this. From letter 82. The virtues, adds the elder, render the possessor of them in the likeness of God. With regard to this last point, it should be explained that following the great holy fathers of orthodoxy, he distinguishes between being in the likeness of God from being in the image of God. The latter expression denotes the possession of a rational soul. In the likeness of God refers to the possession of the totality of the virtues in highly developed permanent form. At the stage of perfection, of perfecting grace, there is a blossoming of the virtues of obedience, wisdom, discernment, humility, patience, chastity, courage, gentleness, temperance, spiritual love, and the other virtues. The orientation of the letters assembled in this book is manifestly what is called otherworldly. The goals set by Blessed Father Joseph the Hesychist are all spiritual. They are set by one who sees human life under the aspect of eternity. Man's most precious possession is his soul, which is immortal. He must take care of it. The elder writes in one of his letters, quote, I earnestly entreat you, take care of your souls. Letter 29. And he explains throughout his 82 letters what he means by taking care of the soul. It means preeminently striving to purify it of all the passions and to adorn it with all the virtues, which perfect perfect it as far as possible during our life on earth. He who cares for his soul in such a manner will abide in peace and contentment in this world and may justly expect to farewell in the life beyond death. Thus Father Joseph says, quote, When the hour of death comes, as soon as these eyes close, the inner eyes of the soul will open, and as it contemplates the things there, suddenly it finds itself in those things it longs for, without realizing how. It passes from darkness to light. End of quote from letter 38. And quote, As from sleep we shall wake up into the other life. Then we will see parents, brothers, relatives. Then we will see angels and saints. We shall converse with them as with brothers, giving one another a divine embrace and continuously wondering at the heavenly choirs until we reach our Master and Savior and thenceforth remain inseparable. End of quote. From letters 40 and 47. Part 1. Letters to Monastics and Laymen. First letter, to a youth asking about the prayer. My beloved brother in Christ, I pray that you are well. Today I received your letter and shall answer all your questions. The information you seek does not require time and effort for me to think and respond. For noetic prayer is for me, as any other man's trade is to him, because I have been working at it now for more than 36 years. When I came to the holy mountain, I immediately sought out the hermits who practiced prayer. Back then, 40 years ago, there were many who had life in them, men of virtue, elders of the past. We chose one of them as our elder and received guidance 
from several of them. Now then, to start mastering noetic prayer, you must constantly force yourself to say the prayer without ceasing. In the beginning, quickly. The noose must not have time to form any distracting thoughts. Pay attention only to the words, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Kyrie Jesu Christe eleis on me. When the prayer is said orally for a long period of time, the noose becomes accustomed to it and eventually takes up saying it. Then it becomes sweet to you as if you had honey in your mouth and you want to keep saying it all the time. If you stop it, you feel greatly distressed. When the noose gets used to it and has taken its fill, when it has learned it well, then it sends it to the heart. Since the noose supplies food for the soul, the task of the noose is to send whatever good or evil it sees or hears down to the heart, which is the center of man's spiritual and physical powers, the throne of the noose. So, when someone saying the prayer keeps his noose from imagining anything and pays attention only to the words of the prayer, then breathing gently with a certain compulsion and volition of his own, he brings his noose down to his heart. He holds it within as if in confinement, rhythmically saying the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. In the beginning, he says the prayer a few times and takes a breath. Later, when the noose has become accustomed to remaining in the heart, he says one prayer with each breath, Lord Jesus Christ, breathing in, have mercy on me, breathing out. This happens until grace overshadows the soul and begins to act within. Beyond this is theoria. So the prayer is said everywhere, seated, in bed, walking, and standing. Quote, Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, says the apostle. However, it is not enough to pray only when you go to bed. It takes a struggle, standing and sitting. When you get tired, sit, then stand up again, so that you are not overcome by sleep. This is called praxis. You show your good intention to God, but everything depends on Him, on whether or not He gives you. God is the beginning and the end. His grace is the driving force that activates all things. As for how love is activated, you will realize how when you keep the commandments. When you get up at night and pray, when you see someone ill and sympathize with him, when you see a widow, orphans, or the elderly, and you are charitable to them, then God loves you. And then you also love him. He loves first and pours out his grace, and we return to him what is his, thine own of thine own. Well, if you seek to find him only through prayer, do not let a single breath pass without it. Just be careful not to accept any fantasies. For the divine is formless, unimaginable, and colorless. He is supremely perfect, not subject to syllogisms. He acts like a subtle breeze in our minds. Compunction comes when you consider how much you have grieved God, who is so good, so sweet, so merciful, so kind, and entirely full of love, who was crucified and suffered everything for us. When you meditate on these and other things the Lord has suffered, they bring compunction. So if you are able to say the prayer out loud without ceasing, in two or three months you can get used to it. Then grace overshadows you and refreshes you. Only say it out loud, without a break. When the noose takes it up, you stop saying it orally. And then when the noose loses grip of the prayer, let the tongue resume saying it out loud. All the forcefulness is needed with the tongue until you get used to it in the beginning. Afterwards, all the years of your life, your noose will say it without exertion. When you come to the holy mountain, as you mentioned, come and see us. But then we shall talk about other things. You will not have time for the prayer. You will find the prayer wherever your mind is at rest. Here you will be visiting the monasteries and your mind will be distracted by the things you see and hear. I am certain that you shall find the prayer. Have no doubts. Only straightway knock at the door of divine mercy and surely Christ shall open unto you. It is impossible for him not to. The more you love him, the more you will receive. The size of his gift, be it great or small, depends on your love, whether it is great 
or small. Second letter to the same person about the prayer and a reply to questions. The eagerness you have to benefit your soul delighted me. I also thirst to benefit every brother who seeks salvation. Therefore, my dearly beloved brother, open your ears. Man's purpose, from the moment he is born, is to find God. However, he cannot find him unless God finds him first. In him we live and move. Unfortunately, the passions have shut the eyes of our soul and we cannot see. But when our very loving God turns an affectionate eye toward us, then we awake as if from sleep and begin to seek salvation. As for your first question, God has now seen you. He has enlightened you and is guiding you. Keep working where you are. Say the prayer incessantly, both orally and noetically. When the tongue gets tired, resume saying it noetically, and when the noose is weighed down, let the tongue begin. Just don't stop. Do many matanyas. Keep vigil at night as much as you can. And if a flame is lit in your heart with love toward God, if you seek Hezekiah and can no longer remain in the world because the prayer is igniting within you, then write to me and I shall tell you what to do. But if grace does not act like this and your zeal is limited to keeping the commandments of the Lord toward your neighbor, then be at peace as you are and you will be fine. Do not seek anything more. You will discover the difference between 30, 60, and 100 when you read the Evangetinos. There you will find many more stories that will benefit you greatly. Now then, in response to your other questions, the prayer must be said with the inner voice. But since initially the noose is not accustomed to it, it forgets to say the prayer. This is why you say it at times orally and at other times noetically. This happens until the noose gets its fill and grace begins to act within. This action of grace is the joy and delight you feel within yourself when you say the prayer, and you want to say it continuously. So when the noose takes over the prayer, and this joy that I am writing about occurs, the prayer will be said unceasingly within you, without any effort on your part. This is called perception of the action of grace, because grace acts without man's volition. He eats, walks, sleeps, awakes, while internally he cries out the prayer continuously, and he has peace and joy. Regarding the hours of prayer, since you are in the world and have various cares, pray whenever you find time, but constantly force yourself so that you do not become negligent. As for Theoria, which you asked about, it is difficult there, for it requires absolute stillness. The spiritual life is divided into three stages, and grace acts in a person accordingly. The first stage is called purification, during which a person is cleansed. What you now have is called the grace of purification. This form of grace leads one to repentance. All the eagerness that you have for spiritual things is due to grace alone. Nothing is your own. It secretly acts upon everything. So when you exert yourself, this grace remains with you for a certain period of time. If a person progresses with noetic prayer, he receives another form of grace, which is entirely different. As we mentioned earlier, this first form of grace is called perception of the action of grace and is the grace of purification. That is, one who prays feels the presence of divine energy within him. The second form of grace is called the grace of illumination. During this stage, one receives the light of knowledge and is raised to the vision of God. This does not mean seeing lights, fantasies, and images, but it means clarity of the noose, clearness of thoughts, and depth of cognition. For this to occur, the person praying must have much stillness and an unerring guide. The third stage, when grace overshadows, is the grace of perfection, truly a great gift. I shall not write to you about this now, since it is unnecessary. However, if you wish to read about it, I have written, despite my illiteracy, a small handwritten pamphlet entitled, A Spirit Moved Trumpet, while I was undergoing these transformations. Search for it. Also purchase the book by St. Macarios from Mr. Skinas 
as well as the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. And you will greatly benefit. In addition, write to me about any transformation you encounter, and I shall answer you with great eagerness. These days, I am constantly writing to those who ask questions. This year, people came from Germany solely to learn about noetic prayer. From as far as America, people write to me with much eagerness. There are also many from Paris who are earnestly seeking. But we who have everything right here at our feet, why are we negligent? Is it really hard labor to cry out continuously the name of Christ so that he may have mercy on us? Furthermore, a sinister notion from the evil one prevails today, that there is a danger of delusion in saying the prayer. On the contrary, this in itself is a delusion. Whosoever desires, let him try it. Once the prayer has acted for a long time, he will feel paradise within himself. He will be freed from the passions. He will become a new man. And if he happens to be in the desert, then, oh, oh, there is no telling of the bounties of the prayer. Third letter. To a monk entering the arena of combat. Rejoice in the Lord, beloved child, whom the grace of my Jesus has enlightened and delivered from the world, who has flown to the wilderness and dwelt in a monastery with a holy synodia, and now glorifies and thanks God with all his soul. Divine grace, my child, is like bait which enters the soul and without coercion attracts a person toward higher and superior things. It knows how to catch us rational fish and to pull us out of the sea of the world. But then what? Once God takes the monastic aspirant out of the world and brings him to the wilderness, he doesn't immediately show him his passions and the temptations until he becomes a monk and Christ binds him with his fear. Then the trial, the struggle, and the fight begin. If a novice exerts himself from the beginning and lights his torch of asceticism with his struggles before it is too late, it will not go out when grace withdraws and temptations come. Otherwise, when grace does withdraw, he will return to his previous state. Then, corresponding to the passions he had in the world, temptations will arise and will revive his former habits which used to enslave him because he used to cater to them. First of all, my child, know that there are great differences from man to man and monk to monk. There are souls with a soft character that are very easily persuaded. There are also souls with a tough character that are not subordinated so easily. They are as different as cotton is from iron. Cotton needs only to be rubbed with words, but iron requires fire and a furnace of temptations to be worked. Such a soul must be patient during temptations to be purified. When a monk does not have patience, he is like a lamp without oil. Soon it will burn out. So, when a person with a, natur a nature harder than iron comes to be a monk, as soon as he enters the arena, he rebels against obedience. Immediately, he breaks his promises and gives up the battle. Then you see that as soon as grace withdraws a little to test his intentions and patience, at once he throws away his weapons and starts regretting that he became to be a monk. Then he passes his days full of disobedience and bitterness, always talking back arrogantly. Then, through the prayers of his elder, grace disperses the clouds of temptations somewhat so that he comes to his senses a little and mends his ways. But soon afterwards he returns once more to his own will, to disobedience, agitation, and annoyance. You write about the brother you see there, and are amazed that although he works so hard at his diaconima, his ego within still overcomes him. But do you think it is easy for man to conquer a passion? Good deeds and almsgiving and all other external good things do not subdue the haughtiness of one's heart. But mental work, the pain of repentance, contrition, and humility are what humble the unsubmissive spirit. An insubordinate person is unbearable and toilsome to deal with. Only with utter patience can he be handled. Only with utter patience on behalf of the elders 
and with the forbearance and love of the brethren can stiff-necked disciples come to their senses. But behold, many times they too are as useful as your right hand. Almost always such people who are in some way more gifted than the others humble themselves with difficulty. They think highly of themselves and look down on others. So a great deal of hard work and patience are needed until this old foundation of pride is dug up and another foundation is set with Christ's humility and obedience. But the Lord, seeing their efforts and good intentions, allows another trial to come upon them which con counteracts their passion. And by his mercy, he who will have all men to be saved, saves them too. As for you, emulate whomever you want. It would be wonderful if everyone had a good character, humility, and obedience. But if one's nature happens to be tougher than iron, he should not despair. He needs to struggle, and by the grace of God he can win. God is not unjust in his expectations. He seeks repayment according to the gifts he has given. For from the beginning of creation he separated men into three classes. He gave five talents to one two to another, and one to the other. The first one has the highest gifts. He has greater mental capacity and is called taught by God because he receives teachings from God without a teacher, just like St. Anthony the Great, St. Ornufrius, St. Mary of Egypt, Kiro Philothes, Luke of Styrion, and thousands of others in the old days who became perfect without a guide. The second type of person has to be taught what is good in order to do it. And the third one, even if he hears, even if he learns, he hides it in the ground. He doesn't do anything. So that is why there is such a big difference among the people and monks that you see. And that is why first and foremost you must know thyself. That is, know who you really are in truth and not what you imagine you are. With this knowledge, you become the wisest man. With this kind of awareness, you reach humility and receive grace from the Lord. However, if you don't obtain self-knowledge, but consider only your toil, know that you will always remain far from the path. The prophet does not say, Behold, O Lord, my toil, but says, Behold my humility and my toil. Toil is for the body. Humility is for the soul. Moreover, the two together, toil and humility, are for the whole man. Who has conquered the devil? He who knows his own weaknesses, passions, and shortcomings. Whoever is afraid of knowing himself remains far from knowledge, and he doesn't love anything else except seeing faults in others and judging them. He doesn't see gifts in other people, but only shortcomings. And he doesn't see his own shortcomings, but only his gifts. This is truly the sickness that plagues us men of the eighth millennium. We fail to recognize one another's gifts. One person may lack many things, but many people together have everything. What one person lacks, another person has. If we acknowledge this, we would have a great deal of humility because God, who adorned men in many ways and showed inequality in all of his creations, is honored and glorified. Not as the unbelievers say, who toil trying to bring equality by overturning the divine creation. God made all things in wisdom. Therefore, my child, now that it is still the beginning, see to it that you know yourself well, so that you set humility as a firm foundation. See to it that you learn obedience and acquire the prayer. May Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on me, be your breath. Do not leave your mind idle so that you aren't taught evil things. Don't let yourself look at the fault of others, because without knowing it, you will become the evil one's partner without any progress in virtue. Do not, out of ignorance, ally yourself with the enemy of your soul. The cunning enemy knows very well how to hide behind passions and weaknesses. So in order to strike him, you must fight and mortify yourself. All your passions, that is. When the old man dies, the strength of your hostile enemy is abolished. We are not battling with a man whom you can kill in many ways, but with the powers and rulers of darkness. 
They are not fought with sweets and marshmallows, but with streams of tears, with pain of soul until death, with utter humility and with great patience. Blood must flow from overexhaustion in saying the prayer. You have to collapse from exhaustion for weeks as if gravely ill, and you must not give up the fight until the demons are beaten and withdraw. Then you will receive freedom from the passions. And so, my child, force yourselves from the beginning to enter the narrow gate because only it leads to the spaciousness of paradise. Cut off your own will every day and hour and seek no other path beside this one. This is the path that the feet of the Holy Fathers trod. Reveal your path unto the Lord and he will guide you too. Reveal your thoughts to your elder and he will heal you. Never hide a thought because the devil conceals his cunning within it. As soon as you confess it, he disappears. Do not reveal another person's fault to justify yourself, because at once grace, which had covered you up until that point, will reveal your own faults. The more you cover your brother with love, the more grace warms you and guides you, guards you from the false accusation of men. As for the other brother you mentioned, it seems that he had some unconfessed sins because he is ashamed to tell them to the elder. And this is why that temptation takes place. But he must correct this improper behavior, for without frank confession, one cannot be purified. It is a shame to be ridiculed by the demons. Deep down, his ego is hiding. May the Lord enlighten him to come to his senses. And you should pray and love him as well as everyone, yet guard yourself from all. In any case, now that you have entered the arena, you will undergo many kinds of temptations, so prepare yourself to be patient. Say the prayer constantly, and the Lord will help you with his grace. Temptations are never stronger than grace. Fourth letter. My child, if you pay attention to everything I write to you. My child, if you pay attention to everything I write to you and compel yourself, you will find great benefit. All these things are happening to you because you're not forcing yourself to say the prayer. So force yourself to say the prayer unceasingly. Don't let your mouth stop at all. In this way, you will grow accustomed to it within yourself, and then the noose will take over. Do not become overconfident with your thoughts, for you will be weakened and defiled. If you pray and continuously force yourself to pray, you will see how much grace you will receive. My child, man's life is full of sorrows because he is in exile. Do not seek perfect rest. Since our Christ bore his cross, we shall bear ours too. If we endure all afflictions, we shall receive grace from the Lord. The Lord allows us to be tempted so that he can test the zeal and love we have for him. Therefore, patience is needed. Without patience, a person does not obtain experience, acquire spiritual knowledge, or attain any measure of virtue and perfection. Love Jesus and say the prayer unceasingly, and it will enlighten you on his path. Be careful not to judge, because then God will allow grace to withdraw and will let you fall and be humbled so that you can see your own faults. Everything that you wrote about is good. The first things that you are feeling are due to God's grace. When it comes, it makes a man spiritual and makes everything seem fine and beautiful. Then he loves everyone and has compunction, tears, and a fervent soul. However, when grace withdraws to test a man, everything becomes carnal and the soul falls. Do not lose your eagerness at this point, but force yourself to cry out the prayer continuously with distress, with might and main. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Kyrie Isu Christe, eleison me. Say the same thing continually, over and over again. And as if you were noetically gazing at Christ, say to him, I thank thee, my dear Christ, for all the good things that thou hast given me and for all the hardships that I suffer. Glory to thee, glory to thee, my God. And if you are patient, grace and joy will come once more. However, temptations, sorrow, agitation, and irritability will come again. Then struggle, victory, and thanksgiving follow. 
This recurs until little by little you are cleansed from the passions and become spiritual. With time, as you grow older, you attain this passion. However, you must struggle. Don't expect good things to come by themselves. One does not become a monk through luxury and comforts. A monk must be insulted, derided, tested. He must fall and then get up so that he can become a true person. He must not be cuddled in his mother's arms. Whoever heard of someone becoming a monk by his mother's side? As soon as he cries out, Oh, she would say, Eat so you don't get sick. Ask Assis, my son, requires deprivation. You cannot obtain virtues through luxury and the easy life. It takes a struggle and much labor. It takes crying out to Christ day and night. It takes patience in all temptations and affliction. It takes suppressing your anger and desires. You will fatigue greatly until you realize that prayer without attention and watchfulness is a waste of time. Work without pay. You must set attention as a vigilant guard over all your inner and outer senses. Without attention, both the noose and the powers of the soul are diffused in vain and ordinary things, like useless water running down the streets. No one has ever found prayer without attention and watchfulness, nipsis. No one has ever counted worthy to ascend to the things above without having despised the things below. Many times you pray and your mind wanders, here and there, wherever it pleases, to everything that attracts it out of habit. It takes considerable force and a struggle to break the mind away from there so that it pays attention to the words of the prayer. Many times the enemy craftily creeps into your thoughts, your words, your hearing, your eyes, and you are unaware of it. When you do realize it later on, you need to struggle greatly to be cleansed. However, don't give up fighting against the evil spirits. By the grace of God, you will be victorious, and then you will rejoice for all that you had suffered. In addition, be careful and tell the others too, not to compliment one another in each other's presence. For if compliments harm the perfect, how much more harmful they will be to you who are still weak. There was once a saint who had a visitor. Three times he told the saint that he was doing his handicraft well. After the third time, the saint replied, Since you came here, you have driven God away from me. Do you see how precise the saints were? For this reason, great caution is necessary in everything. Only reproaches and insults benefit a man spiritually because they give birth to humility. He gains crowns, and by enduring he crushes his egotism and vainglory. Therefore, when they insult you, you arrogant egotist, you impatient hypocrite, and so on, it is a time for patience. If you respond, you lose. So always have the fear of God, have love for everyone, and be careful not to sadden or hurt anyone in any way, because your brother's grief will serve as an obstacle when you pray. Be a good example to everyone in word and deed, and divine grace will always help you and protect you. And be careful, my child. Don't ever forget throughout your entire life that a monk must be a good example to lay people and not behave scandalously just as angels are an example to him. Therefore, it is his duty to be very careful, lest Satan cheat him. If it is necessary for a monk to go out into the world, let him go. However, he must be all eyes and all light. He must see very clearly so that he doesn't suffer any harm while trying to benefit others. Young monks and nuns who are still in the prime of life are particularly endangered when they go out into the world since they are walking in the midst of many snares. As for those who have somewhat matured in age and have become withered through ascases, there is not so much danger. They are not harmed so much as they benefit others, if they have experience and knowledge. But in general, a monk does not obtain any benefit from the world, only praises and glory which clean him out and leave him bare. And woe to him! if divine grace does not protect him according to the need and purpose for which he went out. Fifth letter. Do not clothe yourself only with leaves. 
My beloved child in the Lord, offspring of the divine spirit, I rejoice when you rejoice. Dominions and principalities rejoice along with the cherubim and the seraphim, the angelic hosts, the choirs of martyrs and righteous, and our all-pure mother, the queen and lady of all. Today you glide into my soul with what you wrote with paper and pen. I shall rejoice greatly and be exceedingly delighted if you faithfully complete what you wrote. The war of the enemy begins after three or four years because grace withdraws to test a person and your torch goes out. Things that seem beautiful now, which truly are beautiful, will then seem repulsive, black, and dark. Therefore, don't even think that the things that are happening to you now are real temptations because someone else is protecting you. And since, my beloved child, you sought advice from me, the lowly one, listen. Do not clothe yourself only with leaves, but spread your roots deep to find a spring, as the sycamore tree does, so that you may constantly draw water and continuously grow. Thus, when a drought comes upon you, you will suffer no harm because you have found your own spring. When the torch you now have goes out, you will have another one lit through your works, and you will never suffer from darkness. The method of obtaining these blessings is as follows. First of all, perfect and unquestioning obedience to all. From this arises humility. The distinctive mark of humility is profuse tears, which for three or four years flow like a stream. From them is born ceaseless prayer, called noetic prayer, so that as soon as you say, My sweetest Jesus, tears run. As soon as you say, My Panagia, you are unable to control yourself. Then, from them is born tranquility throughout the body and perfect peace. Once a brother wanted to control himself because the tears had started and someone had knocked on the door, but he was unable to until the tears had ceased of their own accord. That is how much power they have. So if you obtain them, there is no danger of suffering any harm since you have become a different type of person. Not that your nature changes, but grace changes its properties through the divine energies of God. The services should contain substance just as the leaves on a tree covers fruit. Chanting should be done with humility. The noose should hunt out the meaning of the hymn. The intellect should be sweetened by the thoughts of the noose and should be led up to their contemplation. Likewise, reading should be done with much attention so that with all this the soul may increase and grow. Thus the old man fades away and dies, whereas the new man is renewed and overflows with the love of Christ. And then a person is no longer pleased at all with earthly things, but continuously hungers for the heavenly things. The body too must struggle with all its might. It should always be subservient to the spirit. Don't feel sorry for it at all. And whether you are eating or working, don't stop the prayer. And in all prayers, the noose should follow and understand what you are praying and saying. For if you yourself don't understand what you're saying, how will you communicate with God so that he grant what you seek? If you do as I tell you, you will do yourself good. You will be saved forever and also make me happy. But if you disobey out of negligence, you will make many grieve. Sixth letter, you write about anger in the heart of a fool. So listen to me once again. Lay a solid foundation. Build a beautiful little palace in the heavens. Clean the inside of the cup as the Lord instructs us, so that the outside becomes clean as well, because everything done with the body resembles leaves, which merely decorate the outer man. Those works are well and good, but everything I have written to you about previously is what cleanses a person internally. These things will open the eyes of the soul. It is through them that the heart is purified to see God on that day. For without noetic work, there's little benefit from outer works. If you do not see tears pouring forth every time you remember God, you suffer from ignorance, which leads to pride and hardness of heart. So let humility serve as a garment in all your actions and become a sponge in the brotherhood that mops up every reproach and abasement. 
Do not water your soul with honors and praises, but with reproaches and accusations, even if you are innocent. Never seek to find what is just, because then you are unjust. On the contrary, learn to endure temptations bravely, regardless of what kind the Lord permits. Without a lot of excuses, just say, forgive me, and without actually being at fault, repent as if you were. Do so with conviction of soul, not just outwardly admitting to be at fault for the sake of praise while inwardly judging. During times of affliction, do not seek human consolation so that God may console you. The bridge we must all cross is to forgive the transgressions of others. However, if you don't forgive them, you destroy the bridge that you should have crossed. So become a good model and example to the others through your good and God-pleasing deeds and do not wish to defeat everyone with your words. Do not think that you will find rest when you speak out seeking justice for yourself. Justice is to endure with bravery the temptation that comes so that you emerge victorious, whether or not you were at fault. But if you say, but why? You are fighting against God who sent the afflictions because of your passionate condition. God disciplines us so that we reach dispassion. Thus, if you do not endure it, truly you are fighting against God. You write about anger in the heart of a fool. Anger in itself is natural. Just as the body has nerves, the soul has anger. Everyone should use it against the demons, heretics, and anyone who hinders us from the path of God. However, if you get angry with your fellow brothers or get in a rage and ruin the work of your hands, know that you are suffering from vainglory and are abusing the nerve of your soul. You are delivered from this passion through love toward all and true humility. Therefore, when anger comes, close your mouth tightly and do not speak to him who curses, dishonors, reproaches, or bothers you in any way without reason. Then this snake will writhe around in your heart, rise up to your throat, and since you don't give it away out, will choke and suffocate. When this is repeated several times, it will diminish and cease entirely. Since man was created rational and gentle, he is corrected far better with love and gentleness than with anger and harshness. After much and thorough testing, I have also found that with goodness and love you can pacify many. And if someone is of good intentions, you can quickly make him comply and become an angel of God. So this is what I would say to you and to everyone. Never seek to correct each other with anger, but only with humility and sincere love, because one temptation does not cast out another temptation. When you see anger ahead, forget about correcting for the moment. Once you see that the anger has passed, that peace has come, and that your powers of discernment are functioning properly, then you can speak beneficially. I have never seen anyone corrected through anger, but always through love, and then he will even make sacrifices. Therefore, this is how you should act. Take yourself for example. How are you pacified? With curses or with love? Don't you marvel at the words of that saint and the sayings of the desert fathers? Quote, an angry and irritable man is not accepted in the kingdom of God, even if he raises the dead. You say that you respect my words. If this is really true, try out my advice and choke the passion when it comes to choke you. Over and over again, keep the serpent locked up inside and you will immediately find the path to joy and victory. Then the prayers I say for you will take effect right away. And once the mother is defeated, the entire swarm of daughters born of anger is vanquished because the principal passions that give birth to all the rest are anger and desire. Therefore, suppress anger with all your might every time it is aroused, and you will find it weaker the next time. Continually strike at it and cut off its head whenever you see it rising. Then composure, the fruit of forbearance, will soon blossom. Thenceforth, you will have peace and grace, and all good things will follow. Desire, the appetitive aspect of the soul, is the second such mother that hurls the rider, that is the noose. 
When abstinence is applied in everything, and there is no increase of fat, there will be no excess of blood. And then the flesh cannot hurl the person, but it only fights. So resist with rebuttal of thoughts. Don't let thoughts enter, but fight them off with the prayer. Fight valiantly, not torpidly, and the passions will be paralyzed immediately. By doing so, the flower of purity and chastity will blossom, whereby your soul will rejoice with an unspeakable joy and be assured that henceforth a place of rest has been prepared for you. And in this manner, you will paralyze the wickedness of this passion along with the wickedness of all its daughters. Seventh letter. Listen to something that happened to me. Just this moment I received your letter and I saw what you wrote. I am glad that you are healthy, but I am sorry for your afflictions. Everything you mentioned, my child, is happening because you lack patience. You, my child, are seeking Christ. You are seeking to enter the heavenly city. The elder and the fathers are praying for this, and I too, the poor one, am praying out here on the crags. So the Lord heard all of us, and in order to crush your proud soul, to humble and defeat your anger, wrath, temper, and ego, he sent you a flea, this small temptation, to keep biting you so that you learn to bear it. He sent it to bother you so that you learn to be patient. In this way, your anger, wrath, and agitation are gradually soothed. He sent it so that you learn to choke temptations inside you and not let harsh words come out. And then, once that power of Satan has been stifled inside you repetitively, he goes away and leaves the person meek and calm like a little lamb. Listen to something that happened to me. When I was in the world, I could take on thousands. I had a lion's heart, and the love of Christ exhausted me. If I wanted to relate everything I went through on a daily basis with this passion of anger, I would have to write a whole book. Since God wanted to free me from it, he would bring about everything appropriate. People would bother me unjustly. They would insult me. They would annoy me. And they would not just simply tempt me, but they would do things that would make you commit murder. But by enduring and choking Satan within me, with extreme patience, I was delivered from the evil. So the tempter stored up all his best wiles for a severe winter day, as he knows how to tempt, and as God allows one to be tested. He made three or four attempts to tempt me, but he saw that his attacks were futile. Then suddenly a gush of wind burst through the door and blew off the roof with all the pilasters along with thousands of kilos of stones on top of it. It flew through the air like an airplane and tossed it across the crags into the snow. After that we were left under the open sky in the snow. But if you hear also the kinds of temptations I had, you wouldn't be able to bear it without being harmed because you would judge the culprits. Anyway, by enduring your trials, you will receive so much grace instead in proportion to your temptations that you won't be able to measure it. So don't think that if you shy away from this one, no other temptation will come. One will necessarily come. And if you prove to be unmanly with it, that is how you will be with all temptations as well. For the tempter is within us. Don't you see him, my child? Take a look. He ascends from the navel of the belly to the heart and heats it up. He burns it. He heats up the blood and ascends to the throat. He strikes the head. He darkens the noose. He stands in the larynx like a knot and obstructs the air and chokes a person. The one who causes the temptation might well be the worst person, or rather the tempter pushes him too to disturb and upset you. However, the Lord allows him so that you will become more experienced every day and reach dispassion. For when you prepare yourself and expect temptations, you are not confounded, you are not troubled, you do not lose control of yourself. You write that if you knew that you would receive grace, you would endure thousands of temptations like that one. But how do you know that if you endured, you wouldn't receive grace? I am telling you and all the brethren that there is no shorter road than enduring one's temptations, no matter how they come. One's spiritual state and the grace he has are 
testified by his patience. How does the elder endure all you? He has patience. This bears witness to the fact that he has grace, he is virtuous. Virtue does not have a bell so that you can recognize it by its ring. The bell of virtue is forbearance, long-suffering, patience. These are the ornaments of a monk and of every Christian. When a struggler foresees the reward from above and the grace that he is about to receive from the Lord, he endures everything. See how the elder assigned that strong brother to bear and endure that person who is suffering from the devil. To you who are weak, he gave this little thorn. So show patience so that you may also become strong enough to put up with that possessed person. You should bear with him, serve him, and be patient with him. What a great virtue. Do you know what it's like to endure and put up with a lunatic? Once, a lunatic came to us, and I didn't have the heart to turn him away. Everywhere they had kicked him out. Well, I kept him so he could rest a little, so his heart could be warmed, because he is a human being, too. And so what happened next? I made him keep an extremely strict fast, as the Lord said, who of this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And so one day, while we were all outside, he locked all the doors and windows of the cell and left us outside. He wouldn't open up even with many entreaties. What could we do? Finally, we found a screwdriver and took apart the hinges and opened the door, and then we went it outside. Hey, you, I said, why did you lock the doors and leave us outside? Because, he said, there were potatoes and onions inside and I wanted to be an ascetic by myself and eat onions and potatoes. He got well in a little while, but he left and got possessed again. He came three times, and as soon as he got well, he would leave and then go crazy again, and the demons would overcome him. He's hospitalized now. As for you, be careful not to despise one of the least of these who are scorned and sick in this world. For this contempt and affront of yours doesn't stop at these unfortunate fellows, but ascends through them to the presence of the Creator and Fashioner whose image they bear. You will be greatly astonished in that day if you see the Holy Spirit of God resting in them more than in your heart. As for me, I am constantly ill. I am like a paralytic. I can't take ten steps. Because of this and everything else, I am dead tired. Please, I ask that you pray for me, because I have many souls that seek my help. And believe me, my fathers and brethren, for every single soul that is helped, I go through the warfare he has. This is also why your elder is constantly ill. He is debilitated by the mental strain and the temptations which he suffers because of all of you. Therefore, my child, don't repeat what the devil is telling you that the elder is supposedly indifferent to you and overlooks your toil and your needs? How is it possible for him to be indifferent, since he suffers for all of you? Be careful. Cast away this thought and be patient so that God sees your intention and lightens your hard work. Accept the temptation and don't blame the others. For when you don't endure temptations and blame the others, since the Lord gives them to us, then he himself will lash us, which is much harsher and exceedingly more severe. For no man can punish as the Almighty can. Therefore, my child, lay hold of instruction, lest at any time the Lord of all be angry. Love his will and accept what befalls you as your own due, lest he deliver you over to faint-heartedness and blasphemy. And whenever you err and fall, repent once more. Don't despair. Give yourself courage and hope. Say, forgive me, my Christ. Once again, I am repenting. Don't say, the wrath of God is upon me. Isn't it a shame? We're only human. Don't be indignant with the brethren, but bear their faults so that they bear yours. Love them so that they will love you, and endure them so that they will endure you. Become good, and all will become good along with you. Subdue your passions, and you will see many respecting not just your words, but even the wink of your eyes. As for your diaconimas, which you mentioned, 
If there are too many and you don't have time for them and it vexes you, I shall also ask the elder to reduce them so that you won't do them with grumbling. And as for the other things you wrote, they show that you have a great deal of vainglory. Therefore, become a corpse that everyone walks over. Become like mud. Beat, hit, and hate yourself like a bitter enemy. Hate your evil side with perfect hatred. Because if you don't knock him down, he will knock you down. Be brave. Don't feel sorry for him. By the grace of God, I support you. But I shall also remind you of the saying of the Holy Fathers, If you do not shed blood, you shall not receive spirit. Don't consider yourself to be a man if you haven't received grace. If we don't acquire grace in vain, have we been born into the world. The more purified and illumined our soul becomes here, the closer and clearer we shall enjoy Christ's fragrance there, and we shall rejoice and leap for joy more than the others. So don't consider yourself to be a man if you haven't received grace. Eighth letter. Will you not endure everything for my love? There is nothing else that can help appease anger and all the passions as much as love for God and for our every fellow man. It is with love rather than with other struggles that you can win easily. In addition, when love reigns in your noose, you feel no pain while struggling. For this reason, love never faileth, as long as you constantly steer the soul's rudder towards it. And no matter what happens, you shout your maxim, For the sake of thy love, Jesus, my sweet love, I will endure curses, disgraces, injustices, toils, and all afflictions that I might encounter. And at once, while you are pondering these words, the burden of pain is lightened, and the demon's bitterness ceases. Let me tell you a true story. Once, because of my continual and frightful temptations, I was overcome with sadness and faint-heartedness, and I presented my case to God as if I had been treated unjustly. I was complaining because he kept allowing so many temptations to default befall me without curbing them even a little that I couldn't even catch my breath. In this time of bitterness, I heard a very sweet and clear voice within me say with extreme compassion, Will you not endure everything for my love? As soon as I heard that voice, I broke out into many tears and repented for being overcome with faint-heartedness. I shall never forget that voice, which was so sweet that the temptation and all my faint-heartedness immediately disappeared. Will you not endure everything for my love? O oh, truly sweet love, for thy love we are crucified and endure everything. That same brother told me that once he was upset with another brother. He would give him advice, but the latter kept disobeying, and this saddened him greatly. Then, while he was praying, he fell into ecstasy. He saw the Lord nailed to the cross, all bathed in light. Then Christ turned toward him and said, Behold how much I have suffered for your love. What have you endured? And with these words his sadness vanished. He was filled with peace and joy, and shedding fountains of tears, he marveled and continues to marvel at the condescension of the Lord, who permits afflictions but also consoles us when he sees us losing heart. So don't lose heart. Don't worry during times of affliction and temptation, but with the love of our Jesus, alleviate the anger and faint-heartedness. Furthermore, give yourself courage, saying, My soul, don't lose heart. A small affliction can cleanse you from a chronic illness. The truth is that it will soon go away anyway. When we lack patience, our temptations seem greater than they really are. The more a person grows accustomed to enduring them, the smaller they become, and he passes through them effortlessly. Thus he becomes as solid as a rock. So be patient. After many years have passed, what seems difficult to achieve now will fall into your hands for you to possess as your own, without you realizing how it happened. Therefore struggle now during your youth without asking why and losing heart. And when you grow old, you will reap sheaves of dispassion. Then you will wonder how such beautiful crops grew since you did not cultivate anything. You will be astonished how you got rich, you who are worth nothing, 
you will be amazed at how your grumbling, disobedience, and faint-heartedness sprouted such beautiful fruits and fragrant flowers. Therefore, exert yourself. If a righteous person falls even 10,000 times, he does not lose his courage, but he rises up once more and gathers his strength, and the Lord registers victories for him. However, he does not show him his victories, so that he will not think highly of himself. Rather, he makes him fully aware of his faults, so that he sees them, suffers, and is humbled. But once he has passed the barracks of the enemy and has amassed unseen victories elsewhere, the Lord begins to show him little by little that he is winning and is being rewarded, that his hands are touching something that he was previously seeking but had not been given. And in this manner, one is exercised, tried, and perfected as much as our nature, noose, intellect, and soul's vessel can hold. Therefore, be brave and strong in the Lord, and don't let your eagerness flag. Rather, keep seeking and crying out constantly, regardless of whether you receive anything or not. Ninth letter. The Creator breathed into you and gave you a living spirit. Grace is, to put it simply, a small or great gift from God's infinite, divine, rich abundance that He kindly distributes out of His infinite goodness. He accepts everything we render to Him in thanks, namely, wonder, love, worship, hymnody, and doxology, which proceed from the full knowledge of God. The benevolent provider accepts all this from us, and furthermore rewards us with more of His own, Thine own, of Thine own. He distributes out of His own wealth, and we who are poor, blind, and lame are made rich by Him, while He always maintains the same wealth. It does not decrease, nor does it increase. Oh, what inconceivable grandeur! He enriches all. Thousands upon thousands and myriads upon myriads were enriched and became saints, while his wealth remains the same. Therefore, my child, know first of all that every good starts from God. There is no good thought that is not from God, nor is there any bad thought that is not from the devil. So whatever good thing you think, say, or do, all is a gift from God. Every perfect gift is from above. Everything is a gift from God. We have nothing of our own. So everyone who desires grace and wants God to give it to him freely must first properly understand his own existence. Know thyself. This is the real truth, for every object has an origin, and if you don't learn its beginning, it will not turn out to have a good ending for you. Well, the beginning and the truth is for one to realize that he is nothing, zero, and that everything came into being out of nothing. He spake and they came to be. He commanded and they were created. He spake and the earth came to be, and he took clay and formed man without a soul, without a noose, just a clay man. This is your own existence. That is what we all are, dirt and mud. This is the first lesson for him who wants not only to receive grace, but also to have it always abided with him. From this he acquires full knowledge, and from this humility is born. Not just idle words and talking humbly, but with a solid foundation to confess the truth. I am dirt. I am clay. I am mud. This is our first mother. Well, dirt is stepped on, and you as dirt ought to be stepped on. You are mud. You are worthless. You are tossed here and there. They build things with you. As a useless material, you are transformed from one thing to another. All the same, the Creator breathed into you and gave you a living spirit. And behold, at once you became a rational man. You speak, work, write, teach. You have become a machine of God. However, don't forget that your root is earth. And if he who gave you your spirit takes it away, once again you will be used to build walls. Therefore, remember thine end, and thou shalt not sin unto the ages. This is the first cause that not only attracts grace, but also increases and retains it. Grace raises the noose to the first theoria of nature. Without this beginning, 
One finds some small amount of grace but loses it after a while because he is not building on solid ground, but is striving with methods and artifices. For example, you say, I am a sinner, but deep down you consider yourself to be righteous. You are unable to avoid delusion. Grace wants to remain, but since you haven't really found the truth yet, necessarily it has to leave. For without a doubt you will come to believe in your thoughts that say that you are something you are not. Consequently, grace does not stay. For we have an adversary who is a mighty expert, an inventor of evil, and creator of every delusion. He is vigilant to trip us up. He became darkness from light and knows almost everything. He is the enemy of God and seeks to make all of us become his enemies as well. And finally, he is an evil spirit and easily intermingles with the spirit God bestowed upon us. Thus, he takes our little motor and runs it however he wants. He observes where the soul's desire leans and in what manner God helps it, and at once he contrives things similar to delude us. There are battles that a person knows and avoids, but there are also others which he is unaware of because the struggle is noetic, it is difficult to discern them. There are changes of the soul, movements of the mind, bodily illnesses and alterations. The Creator, who fashioned the clay, made our composition out of four elements, dry, wet, hot, and cold. Consequently, it is necessary for a man to suffer constantly according to the change of each element, that is, to get dry, wet, hot, and cold. And if the properties of one element are in excess, the body will of necessity get sick, and therefore the soul will suffer too. The noose is unable to produce its noetic movements because it suffers along with the body. Is the body dried up by the sun's heat? Then the noose is dried up as well. Is the body affected by humidity and limp when it rains? Then the noose is also limp. Is the body cold when the wind blows? Then bile greatly increases. The noose is darkened and only fantasies prevail. So in all these changes, even though grace is present, it is not active because we are too weak. But our enemy, the devil, knows how to fight us during each change. During dry spells, he hardens you to become like a rock, to talk back, to disobey. When it is cold, he knows how to cool your zeal to make you cold and frozen before holy things. When it is hot, he knows how to get you angry and agitated and not let you discern what is true. For as we have said, the blood is in excess, and with the warmth it rouses desires and anger the passionate part of the soul. And when it is humid, he causes sleepiness, laxity, languor, and paralysis throughout the body. So in all of these cases, the soul suffers along with the body, even though it is, a spiritual, it is spiritual and bodiless. Grace is similar. When it approaches a person, it does not change his nature, but it fills and overfills as much as each person's vessel can hold. The same natural properties and good attributes with which his nature is endowed. Also, it can reduce and remove natural weaknesses. Just as man was first fashioned, then breathed into, thus praxis must proceed theoria. Everything done by the body is called praxis, whereas everything done by the mind is theoria. It is impossible to reach theoria without praxis. So struggle now in everything that praxis requires and the more spiritual things will come by themselves. Behold, you have learned that you are clay, poor and naked. Now seek from him who is able to regenerate nature to make you rich, and whether he gives you a lot or a little, acknowledge your benefactor. And do not boast of foreign things as your own. You will receive grace with pain and tears, and then with tears, thanksgiving, and fear of God you will keep it. With fervency, and zeal is it attracted, with coldness and negligence is it lost. Christ does not demand anything from you to give you his holy gifts other than to acknowledge that anything good you happen to have belongs to him. Sympathize with him who does not have gifts. Don't judge him because he doesn't have any, saying that he is a sinner, depraved, evil, a babbler, a thief, 
a fornicator, a liar. If you acquire this knowledge, you will never be able to judge anyone, even if you see him committing a mortal sin, because you would say right away, He doesn't have your grace, my Christ, and that is why he sins. If you leave me, I shall do worse things. If I am standing, it is because you are supporting me. This brother does as much as he can. He is blind. How do you expect him to see without eyes? He is poor. How can you demand riches from him? Give him riches. Give him eyes to see. If you seek justice in anything, when your neighbor treats you unjustly, dishonors you, reviles you, hits you, persecutes you, or even plots against your life, you are unjust if you consider him to be the cause or passionately criticize him. For you are seeking from him something that God has not given him. If you understand fully what I am telling you, everyone will seem unaccountable for whatever his faults may be, and only you will be accountable for everything. There are three enemies that fight the human race, the demons, our own nature, and habit. Except for these, there is no other enemy. Take away the devil that tyrannizes all mankind, and all of us would be good. Behold, who is to blame? It is him you should hate and condemn and consider to be your enemy until the end. The other enemy we mentioned is one's nature. As soon as a person realizes what the world really is, his nature resists against the law of the spirit and desires everything that destroys the soul. Behold, another enemy that should be hated all your life. This is what you should criticize and blame. In addition, we have a third enemy, habit. Once we grow accustomed to doing all kinds of evil, it becomes a habit to us and takes the place of second nature with sin as a law. And this also requires a similar struggle for God to change our bad habits and deliver us from them. Behold, then, the third enemy, which deserves complete hatred. So, if you want your neighbor to be good in everything as you wish, take away from him these three enemies with the grace you possess. This is justice. If you want to find it, pray that God frees him from these enemies, and then you will be both in harmony. Otherwise, if you seek to find justice any other way, you will always be unjust, and consequently grace will keep coming and going until it finds rest in your soul. A person is entitled to have only the amount of grace that corresponds to how thankfully he endures temptations and how much of his neighbor's burden he bears without grumbling. Now then, the previous letters I sent you deal with praxis. This letter I wrote now contains illumination. A person receives illumination of knowledge from praxis. Praxis itself, however, is blind, but illumination is the eyes through which the noose sees what it could not see at first. So now it has a lamp and eyes, and it views things differently. First was the grace of praxis, but now the noose has received grace tenfold. Now the noose has turned into heaven. It sees far. It has much more capacity than before. Now only Theoria is missing. As king, it has found the throne, and only the theater is missing, which we shall talk about another time. Recopy these letters with ink so that they aren't erased, since they are written in pencil, and study them to correct your conduct. Tenth letter. Grace always precedes temptations as a warning to prepare. Praxis is not to try out and then retreat, but to enter the battle, duel, defeat, and be defeated, win and lose, fall and rise, crush the gates everywhere, and to expect struggles and fights until one's last breath. In addition, one must never become overconfident before his soul leaves the body. But even when he is ascending to heaven, he must expect to descend into Hades at any moment. I would even say that the descent can occur at that very moment. So one should not be surprised at changes, but should be aware that both conditions are his. Know that grace always precedes temptations as a warning to prepare. As soon as you see grace, tighten your belt and say, The declaration of war has come. Watch out. 
you man of clay, where the malicious one will wage the battle. Many times it comes quickly, other times after two or three days. But it shall definitely come. So your fortifications should be solid. Confess, confession every evening. Obedience to the elder. Humility and love toward all. And this way you alleviate the affliction. Now, if grace comes before purification, I ask that you be careful and keep a clear mind. Grace is divided into three stages, purifying, illuminating, and perfecting. Life is also divided into three stages, according to nature, above nature, and contrary to nature. Man ascends and descends within these three stages. There are also three great charismata that one receives, theoria, love, and dispassion. During praxis, purifying grace helps a person to purify himself. When anyone repents, it is grace that urged him to repent. And whatever he does, he does with God's grace, even though he may be unaware of it. Nevertheless, it is grace that nourishes and guides him. And according to the progress he is helped to make, he ascends, descends, or remains in the same state. If he has zeal and self-denial, he ascends to theoria, which is followed by enlightenment of divine knowledge and partial dispassion. But if his zeal and eagerness cool, then the action of grace will also withdraw. Regarding one who prays cognitively, as you mention, this refers to one who is aware of what he is praying for and seeking from God. He who prays cognitively does not use vain repetitions or ask for superfluous things. On the contrary, he knows the place, the method, and the time, and seeks what is suitable and beneficial for his soul. He communicates noetically with Christ. He grasps him and lays hold of him, saying, I will never let you go. So he who prays asks for the remission of his sins and for the Lord's mercy. And if he asks for grand things before their time, the Lord does not give them to him, because he gives things in due order. But if he keeps burdening him with his requests, he allows the spirit of delusion to imitate grace and deceive him by showing him nonsense. Therefore, it is not beneficial to ask inordinately. But even if his requests are heard before he is purified, if he did not ask at the right time, they turn into snakes and harm him. So you should have a pure repentance and be obedient to all, and grace will come on its own without your asking. Like a stammering infant, man seeks from God his holy will. And God, as an extremely good father, gives him grace, but he also gives him temptations. If man endures the temptations without grumbling, he receives additional grace. The more grace he receives, the more temptations he will have. When the demons approach to begin a battle, they do not attack in a place where you will defeat them effortlessly, but rather they test to see where your weakness is. The place where you least expect them is where they dig through the wall of the fortress. And when they find an ill soul and a weak spot, they always defeat him there and render him accountable. Do you seek grace from God? Instead of grace, he allows a temptation. Are you unable to withstand the battle and do you fall? Then you are not given any additional grace. Do you seek it again? Again temptation, again defeat, again deprivation. This happens your whole life. Therefore, you must emerge victorious. Endure the temptation till death. Fall down like a casualty in battle. Cry out like a paralytic on the ground. I will never leave thee, sweetest Jesus, nor forsake thee. I will remain inseparable from thee until the end of time, and I will die in the arena for thy love. Then suddenly he appears in the arena and calls out from the whirlwind, I am here, gird up thy loins like a man and follow me. And you reply full of light and joy, Woe to me the wretch, woe to me the evil and useless one. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself and reckon myself dust and ashes. Then you are filled with divine love and your soul burns as did Cleopas's. And in times of temptation, you no longer leave the linen cloth and flee naked, but 
Persevere in afflictions with the thought that just as one temptation passed after another, so too will this one pass. However, when you lose heart and grumble and do not endure the temptations, instead of winning, you must continually repent for the faults of the day and the negligence of the night. And instead of receiving grace upon grace, you increase your afflictions. Therefore, do not be intimidated and do not be afraid of temptations. Even if you fall many times, arise. Don't lose your composure. Don't be discouraged. They are clouds and will pass. And when you have passed through all of this, which constitutes praxis, with the assistance of grace, which cleanses you from all the passions, then your noose experiences illumination and is moved to theoria. The first theoria is of creation, that God created everything for man, even the angels, for his service. How much worth, how much grandeur, what a great destiny man has, who is the very breath of God. That is, he was not created to live the few days of his exile here, but to live eternally with his creator, to see the heavenly angels, and to hear their inexpressible melody. What joy, what grandeur, as soon as this life of ours reaches its end and these eyes close, immediately the other ones open and the new life begins, the true joy that does not end. While thinking such things, the noose is plunged into deep peace and extreme tranquility that spreads throughout the body, and one completely forgets that he exists in this life. These theorias come one after another. It is not a matter of fabricating fantasies in one's noose, but the state is due to the action of grace which brings thoughts, and then the noose occupies itself with theoria. Man does not fabricate them, but rather they come by themselves and seize the noose into theoria. And then the noose expands, and a person is beside himself. He is illumined. Everything is open to him. He is filled with wisdom, and like a son he possesses his father's belongings. He knows that he is nothing, made of clay, but also a son of the king. He owns nothing, but possesses everything. He is filled with theology. He cries out insatiably, confessing with full awareness that his existence is nothing. His origin is clay, but his vital force is the breath of God, his soul. Immediately his soul flies to heaven. I am the inbreathing, the breath of God. Everything has dissolved and remained on earth, out of which it was taken. I am a son of the eternal king. I am a god by grace. I am immortal and eternal. In a moment, I am beside my heavenly Father. Truly, this is the destiny of man. For this reason, he was created and must return whence he came. These are the kinds of theorias that occupy a spiritual person. He awaits the hour when he will leave his earth behind and when his soul will fly to heaven. So take courage, my child, and with this hope endure every pain and affliction, since in a little while we shall be made worthy of these things. It is the same for all of us. We are all children of God, and day and night we call upon him, along with our sweet, dearest mother, the lady of all, who never abandons anyone who entreats her. Eleventh letter. I found many of the fathers in praxis and theoria. When the love of our Lord sets a person's soul on fire, he is no longer held down by measures, but transcends limits. That is why it casteth out fear, and whatever he writes or says, he tends towards immeasurableness. But at this moment of grace, in the presence of the flaming brilliance of divine love, anything he tries to say is insignificant. Afterwards, once grace recedes and the cloud withdraws, then a pair of compasses comes in and looks for a measure to explain it. Well, everything I wrote to you was written for one purpose, to warm up the fervor of your soul, to incite it to desire ardently our sweetest Jesus, just as officers in the army tell their troops, about the feats of the brave and thus make them fight valiantly. Likewise, the lives of the saints, the writings they left us, have the same purpose. Likewise, if the soul, since God made it like this, does not hear about these lofty and wondrous things often, 
it is overcome with drowsiness and negligence. And only with such things, with readings and stories of spiritual worth, can one banish forgetfulness and restore the old edifice. As for me, when I came to the holy mountain, I found many of the fathers in Praxis and Theoria, ancient holy men. One of them was Elder Kalinikos, a first-rate ascetic, a recluse for 40 years. He practiced the noetic work and thrived on the sweetness of divine love and became beneficial to others as well. He experienced ecstasy of the noose. Further down from him was another holy man, Elder Eurasimos, a total hesychist, an amazing ascetic, 90 years old. He practiced noetic prayer. He was from Chios and spent 17 years at the peak of Mount Prophet Elias. Even though he wrestled with demons and was badly battered by the weather, he remained an unshakable pillar of endurance. He had continuous tears. He led his carefree life sweetened by the contemplation of Jesus. Higher up was Elder Ignatius. He was blind for many years, a spiritual father for years, an elder, 95 years old, no praying noetically without ceasing. The prayer made his mouth give off such a fragrance that you would rejoice talking with him near his mouth. There was also another even more admirable elder at the cave of St. Peter the Athenite, Father Daniel, an imitator of St. Arsenios the Great a profoundly silent recluse. He served liturgy daily until the end of his life. For 60 years, he never even thought of omitting the divine liturgy. Even during Great Lent, he served pre-sanctified liturgies every day. He died in deep old age without ever getting sick. His liturgy always lasted three and a half or four hours because he couldn't say the petitions due to his compunction. He always soaked the ground in front of him with his tears. That is why he didn't want any strangers to be present at his liturgy so that they wouldn't see his work. But as for me, since I begged him very fervently, he accepted me. And every time I went, after walking three hours at night to attend that truly fearsome and divine spectacle, he told me one or two sayings as he left the altar and immediately hid himself until the next day. He had noetic prayer and all-night vigils throughout his life. It was from him that I also received my schedule and found great benefit. He ate only 100 grams of bread every day. He was all wrapped in his liturgy. He never finished a liturgy without a ground turning into mud from his tears. There were also many others with Theoria whom I was not counted worthy to see because they had died one or two years beforehand. I asked people to tell me about their wondrous feats because this is what I occupied myself with. Step by step, I wandered the mountains and caves to find people like this because my elder was good but simple. After I prepared his food, he would give me a blessing to search for such people who would benefit my soul. After I buried him, I explored all of Athos. There was one in a cave who had to cry seven times a day. This was his work. He would pass the entire night in tears, and his headrest was always thoroughly soaked. His helper went there only two or three times a day. His elder did not want to have him near him so that he would not interrupt his mourning. Once he asked his elder, Yeronda, why do you cry so much? My child, when man beholds God, he sheds tears out of love and cannot contain himself. There were also others of lesser significance, such as Father Cosmas and the rest. There were also others of greater significance. If someone would write about them, he would need a lot of paper. All of them have left this life here and live under the ages there. But today you don't hear about such things, for people are so preoccupied with cares and material worries and have such complete disdain for noetic work that most of them not only do not want to inquire, to investigate, to do these things, but they immediately rise up adversely against a person if they hear him even talking about it. And they consider him absurd and foolish because his life is different and he seems ridiculous to them. It is similar to what happened in the days of idolatry. Back then, if you reviled the idols, 
they would stone you or put you to a miserable death. Now in our times, every passion has taken the place of an idol. And if you reprove or criticize the passion that you see overcoming each person, they all shout, stone him because he reviled our gods. Finally, since without any exception, I do not socialize, nor do I want to hear how people in the world and monks are living or what they are doing. I am continually the target of condemnation. Yet I don't cease praying for the fathers day and night and saying that they are right. Only I am at fault because I scandalize them, since they see with whatever eyes God gave them. Wouldn't it be unjust and unfair for me to say, why don't they see as I can see? May the God of all have mercy on everyone through the prayers of the holy God-bearing fathers. Twelfth letter. Thus the noose becomes all light, all clarity. My child, since your elder has experience with prayer, there is no danger of being deluded. Do as your elder tells you, and don't feel sad if grace comes and goes. For this is how it trains a person to think humbly and not become arrogant. In the beginning, this is how an infant acts. Woe to thee, O city, when thy child, when thy king is a child, say the holy scriptures. Woe to thee, O soul, when thy noose is a beginner in these things. The noose, my child, cannot remain motionless, especially the noose of one who is spiritually weak. One moment he needs reading, another moment chanting, later silence. When a person is silent, the noose finds the opportunity to meditate on various themes from the scriptures which he had read previously. So when you give the noose whatever it likes that is good, it gains strength, just as the body does when it receives healthy food. But when you give it just anything, then it is darkened instead of being enlightened. Likewise, when it is tired, it needs rest. In this manner, it learns to discern the good from the bad. Thus the noose becomes all light, all clarity. It sees the soul's purity. It sees the thorns. It endures temptations. Grace increases. The body is cleansed of passions. The soul becomes peaceful. And finally, everything comes in succession as if chained together, quickly and without much toil. This is all the result of perfect ob obedience. Furthermore, you should know that he who has perfect obedience is totally free from cares. Now then, the noose is the steward of the soul that carries its food, that is, whatever you give it. So when it is at peace and you give it the good things at once, it lowers them into the heart. First of all, the noose is cleansed from whatever predispositions it was obsessed with in the world. It is disentangled from the cares of life, and by constantly saying the prayer, it completely stops wandering. And then you realize that it has been purified because it no longer in inclines towards the evil and filthy things which it had seen or heard in the world. Afterwards, through the prayer that is going in and out of the heart, the noose clears a path and expels all indecency, evil, and filth from the heart. For the noose declares war against the passions and against the demons who arouse the passions and who have been lurking in the heart for so many years without anybody seeing or knowing about them. But now that the noose has acquired purity, its original garment, it sees them, and like a watchdog, barks, howls, and fights with them as lord and guard of the entire intellectual part of the soul. It wields the name Jesus like a weapon and flogs the enemies, who also are barking like wild dogs, until it throws them all out to the periphery of the heart. Then the noose begins to clean up all the filth and dirt with which the demons had defiled us every time we assented to do anything evil and sinful. It proceeds to fight with the demons in order to drive them out and remove them entirely so that they do not disturb it at all. And it constantly struggles to throw out the filth which they constantly throw in. Then, as a good steward, it carries provisions suitable for the enlightenment and health of soul. In all of this, Purifying grace assists. The one praying is covered under the protection of obedience as if he were in the shade. He is guarded by the grace of him who has assumed the responsibility of his soul before God, and slowly the change of the Most High occurs. 
In short, once the demons have been completely banished and the inner heart has been purified, the defilement ceases. The noose is enthroned upon the heart as a king and rejoices like a groom with his bride in the bridal chamber. He celebrates with a holy, peaceful, pure joy. He says the prayer effortlessly, and then grace acts freely and shows his noose the promises that he expects to receive as a reward if he carries out his obligations without fail. Once grace has come upon him, he is henceforth calm and peaceful, and it raises him to theoria in proportion to the foundation's capacity. So it is primarily the fear of God, faith, perfect obedience, and self-denial that bring all these good things. Then a person attains blessed love and finally dispassion, so that evil is no longer active in his noose. Rather, he cries out from the depths of his heart, My soul thirsted for thee, my God, when shall I come and appear before thy holy countenance? And he awaits death as the greatest joy. He waits the time when these eyes will close and the other ones will open, whereby he will see everything with joy forever. Therefore exert yourself, my child, exert yourself in blessed obedience where all these good things lie and live as one soul in different bodies. Then the elder is relieved and has time to pray for you with all his soul and is full of joy and delight. Whereas when you are disobedient and deprive yourselves of all these blessings, his soul is continually burdened and weakened from the grief, and slowly he proceeds towards death. I have tried out all these things through experience, and I have eaten their fruit, and it is very sweet. Personally, I have never seen anything more comforting in my soul than perfect obedience. I buried my good little elder, and I found Hezekiah through his prayers. So then labor now while you are young so that you will reap the fruit of dispassion in old age. And not in ripe old age, but in twenty years you will see what I am telling you if you exert yourselves. But if you don't exert yourselves, even if you live as long as Methuselah, you will never enjoy these gifts. So exert yourselves and emulate the elder and each other in what is good and you will see the passions completely immobilized and will enjoy such peace of soul as if you were in paradise. Thirteenth letter. The grace of God doesn't depend on one's years. I received your letter, my child, and I shall answer all your questions. Well, you asked who receives grace more quickly, a hesychist or a dis disciple? Without a doubt, an obedient disciple not only receives grace quickly, but also is always safe. There is no danger of falling or getting lost. Only he must not fall into negligence. That is enough. Once Christ enters a man, he has Hezokia, both when he is alone and when he is with many people and has peace everywhere. The grace of God doesn't depend on one's years, but on the way he struggles and on the mercy of the Lord. Experience through praxis is obtained with the years, but grace, and that is why it is called grace, in other words, a gift, depends on God and is given in proportion to the fervency of faith, humility, and good intentions. Solomon received grace when he was twelve. Daniel was also the same age. David was a youth tending his father's sheep, and it was the same for all the ancient and recent saints. When a person truly repents, grace approaches at once and it increases with zeal, but experience is obtained only with many years of ascesis. He who seeks grace from the Lord must, above all, endure temptations and afflictions no matter how they come. Otherwise, if he becomes indignant and doesn't show enough patience during a temptation, neither will grace manifest itself, nor will his virtue be perfected, or will he be counted worthy of any spiritual gift. Whoever has learned that afflictions and in general everything that temptations cause us are gifts from the Lord has truly found the way of the Lord. Such a person eagerly waits for them to come because he is purified through them, and by enduring them he is illuminated and beholds God. God is not seen in an other way except through spiritual knowledge. This knowledge is theoria. That is, when you understand that God is near you and that you move about within God 
and that he sees whatever you do, and you are careful not to sadden him, since he sees everything inside and out, then you don't sin because you see him, you love him, and you are careful not to sadden him, for he is at your right hand. Therefore, everyone who sins does not see God, but is blind. Fourteenth letter. Truly great is the mystery of obedience. Rejoice in the Lord, child of the Heavenly Father. You write, my child, about a thought against the elder. You should greatly fear this thought of yours. Avoid it as if it were a poisonous snake, for it has a frightful influence upon our generation. This is a ruse of the evil one. He brings you thoughts against your elder in order to alienate you from the grace that protects you and to make you accountable. Then he will ravage you mercilessly. Therefore, keep my advice and never let any thought against your spiritual father lurk in your heart. Get rid of it immediately as if it were a poisonous snake. Furthermore, regarding the book you sought, even if you were about to be saved through it, don't get it without a blessing. For without a blessing it is considered adultery before God. You should keep so much exactness in small and large matters that without the blessing of your spiritual father, you should neither pray nor give alms nor do any other good deed. Take Saul, for example, whom God chose amongst all the tribes of Israel and anointed king. But since he did not have perfect obedience to Samuel and kept the good animals for the sacrifice, God destroyed him. Even as the prophet said, obedience is better than a pure sacrifice. Truly great is the mystery of obedience. Since our sweet Jesus first marked out this path and became a model for us, aren't we obliged to follow him? My child, I wish I were also amongst you practicing my truly beloved obedience. For I wholeheartedly confess with all my strength, with complete awareness, that there is no other path of salvation like this one, remote from every delusion and action of the enemy. And if someone truly desires to be saved and find our sweet Jesus soon, he should have obedience. Furthermore, he should look upon his elder as an image of Christ. So, my child, hold on firmly to the whole armor that you received and fight strongly. Aim your arrows well at your enemies with one goal in mind, never to disobey your spiritual father. For if you sat in God, you have as an intercessor your elder who entreats him on your behalf. But if you sat in your elder as well, who will propitiate the Lord for you? Struggle in accordance with your strength to lighten your elder's burden, so that you may have relief and patience in your afflictions. For I know through personal experience how much responsibility and how great a burden the elder assumes, and how much he suffers until he makes an unworthy soul worthy and leads it into paradise, especially if it happens to have a tough character. A very heavy chain is placed around the elder's neck for every soul for which he assumes the responsibility. To lighten his burden, it takes many holy prayers. It takes much unadulterated love, not disobedience and backtalk. It takes devotion and grace overflowing from his disciples' lips, not gall and bitterness, bickering and quarrels. Every harsh word you say to him in times of temptation, since it proceeds from the serpent, the devil, waters his soul with poison, and his soul withers like a flower struck by hail then he is in no longer able to pray for himself until the pain goes away. Conversely, when the disciples are obedient in everything, then the elder is uplifted. He prays fervently. He is enlightened abundantly. He speaks wisely. He advises in good order. He receives additional grace. And he becomes an ever-flowing spring, distributing to everyone the divine grace that he has received from the Lord. Therefore, my child, if you wish to progress quickly, without much labor, learn to abandon every personal opinion so that it does not become your will. Let your ear be by the mouth of your elder and accept whatever he tells you as if it were from the mouth of God. Execute his commands without hesitation and you will always be at peace. In addition, you must always remember that your obedience or disobedience does not stop at the elder but ascends to God through him. Never conceal a thought from your elder, and never alter your words while confessing before the Lord. 
Reveal your thoughts forthrightly, and at once your heart will be at rest. Break your neck under the yoke of obedience and cleave to the breath of your elder. As soon as a word comes out of his mouth, grab it. Grow wings and take off to carry it out without examining whether it is right or wrong. Blindly and indiscriminately do whatever he who is responsible for you orders so that you will be unaccountable for your actions. Whoever gives orders will be accountable for whether or not he gave good orders. You will be accountable for whether or not you had good obedience. Obedience is not to carry out this or that order that you were given while you object on the inside. Obedience is to subordinate your soul's convictions so that you may be freed from your evil self. Obedience is to become a slave in order to become free. Purchase your freedom for a small price. Become unaccountable and joyful. And don't listen to that thought of yours which advises you to abandon your monastery in difficult times. Know full well that he who is not obedient to one will be obedient to many, that is, many passions, and in the end remains insubordinate. Fifteenth letter. So you won't listen to me and go back. God said to Adam, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And I say to you, Who put into your head all those things you wrote? Have you opened a door to the enemy, who has entered with his entire encampment and humbled your soul? My child, you should have thoughts of all these things before you wore the holy garment. Now that you wear the angelic schema, and Christ has put a seal on all your promises to him, these thoughts no longer have any place within you. For once the mystery was performed, relatives and parents and everything became non-existent. Now pay close attention to my words. If afterwards a monk becomes languid and lazy and leaves his elder or synodia without due cause, woe to him, because he will fall into great tribulations and will not escape retribution. He will be paying all his life, and in the end he will still be in debt. He will be considered to be one who has broke his vows and a transgressor of the commandment. For the Lord said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And furthermore he said, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. And likewise, better is it that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. So when Christ explicitly declares these things, he who is your teacher, God and Father, who holds in his hands your breath and your life, what place do those things have that you are saying now? That supposedly you will not have any peace, that your conscience will prick you continually because of the responsibilities you left behind and other such things. Let God, who laid down the terms and set the boundaries, think about these things. Let him be accountable to himself if he did not say these things right. But as for you and me and all who have worn this holy schema, we should at all costs keep the promises we made to him, so that we may become heirs of the blessings he has promised us. And don't think that your parents will benefit now if you go back. Their souls will be greatly harmed, and those who are at home will head for perdition, since they resist the divine will. But neither shall I ever participate in this sin, nor do I agree with your solution. But even if the elder gets tired in the end and lets you go, he will pay verily dearly for this concession. So completely erase from your memory this evil recollection, in order to stop the warfare of thoughts and to pacify your heart. Otherwise, if you are defeated and go back, not only will I write you no more letters, but I shall also entirely erase you from my heart. I am unable to do more than this, since I see that although you realize that this is a temptation from the devil, you persist in listening to him. So what more can I write? But listen to me, now that there is still time. For when a person knowingly gives in to a temptation, later there will come a time when he is no longer able to listen to what is healthy and salutary, because the hearing of his soul will already be ruined. After that, he becomes contemptuous and walks towards perdition. Don't you see 
that when the Lord was speaking to all, at the end he concluded, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Therefore, leave aside these thoughts of yours and establish your mind with a governing spirit. You have no obligation for anything you left behind when you left the world and your family. He who created the heaven and earth has providence and solicitude for everything and takes care of every one. Now, listen to something amazing that happened here on the holy mountain, since you might not have heard of it yet. There was a monk here at Katanakia in our days, whom I didn't meet because he had died a little before I arrived. He was the disciple of a blind elder. One day a poor layman passed by his cell, and the young monk asked him, Where are you from? It turned out they were from the same village. The monk didn't tell him who he was. He only asked how Mr. X was doing, who was his father. The stranger said that he had died and left his wife and three daughters in the streets as poor orphans. He said that they had also had a son who had left years ago, but they don't know what happened to him. So the monk was immediately wounded as if he had been struck by lightning, and at once he was attacked by a barrage of thoughts. I will leave, he said to his elder. I will leave and go protect them. He asked for a blessing. His elder didn't give it. He kept insisting. His elder gave him advice, weeping for himself and for his disciple. But it was impossible to convince him. Finally, he let him do his will, and the disciple left. Once he left the holy mountain, he sat down to rest in a tree's shade. Coincidentally, another traveling monk arrived there too, and also sat down to rest under the same tree. Then the one who showed up started saying, I see that you are troubled, my brother. Won't you tell me what's wrong? Don't ask, he said. I suffered a great misfortune. And he related his whole story in detail. Then his good wayfarer said to him, If you would, dear brother, listen. Go back to your elder and God will protect your home. Serve your elder, especially since he is blind. But he wouldn't listen. He was overcome with thoughts and the words of the other monk seemed like nonsense to him. Even though he was given many examples as now I am giving you, the disobedient monk got up to continue his trip to the world. Then the other monk who showed up finally asked him, So, you won't listen to me and go back? No, he answered stubbornly. Well then, said the monk who showed up, I am an angel of the Lord. And as soon as your father died, God commanded me to be by their side to protect them and to be their guardian. Well, now that you're going there instead of me, I will abandon them since you're not listening to me. And he disappeared right in front of him. At that point, the monk came to his senses and returned immediately to his elder. And he found him on his knees praying for him. Do you understand, my child? That is what happens when we leave everything to God, since he arranges everything very well as a good ruler, and there is no error in his goodwill. Therefore, he who seeks salvation must have patience. But if we demand that God does things the way we like, and according to our discernment, then woe to our wretched condition. The devil is unable to enter wherever there is the blessing of obedience and the bond of love. So he struggles in every way to make a monk defect, and thus isolate him, and afterwards to make him a plaything of his evil wiles. However, if he is prudent, he will listen to his superiors who know the way, and then the devil who sets traps falls, and the evil returns upon his own head. So have obedience now to those older than you, and in good time you will also become experienced to benefit those who are younger. There will come a time when you will acquire what you don't have now and seems difficult for you to accomplish and you will wonder how you acquired it, since you had already stopped asking for it. These things will happen as long as you persevere and keep seeking the purification of the soul. And that is enough. Anger will cease. Peace will come. You will find dispassion commensurate to your work, and you will find the prayer. Just seek and exert yourself as much as you can. Everything is not achieved all at once, as with the body. You did not become a man from an infant all at once. Now all these falls are lessons for you to learn humility, 
so you shouldn't be distressed, but you should be careful and brace yourselves for the battles which are coming one after another. The lesson of each battle should be a preparation for the next. The preparation is to say, whatever happens to me, whatever under the sky the demons are able to do, I will not put forward my own will. I will not express my opinion, and I will not argue. Let the command be wrong. Let it be anything like a cross. I will do it without discrimination, and let God see my heart and alleviate my warfare. Man should stand like a sentry and wait to see from where the enemy will strike. Then at once he should turn his weapons in that direction. All his life he should not expect a respite, even though many times the Lord gives one. However, he must never become cocky, but must be constantly vigilant, like a soldier during a battle, because a single moment can be worth so much more and can bring so much more benefit to the soul than an entire year can. The same holds true, however, for spiritual damage, if one is not cautious.